So Syria, we are all hearing and reading the news, seeing the headlines. Recently there was a picture that many of us got moved by, the picture of five-year-old Abran sitting inside Aleppo, stunned by having been pulled out from the rubbles after yet another um, a attack uh, on his city. And I'm wondering how many of us here in this room saw that picture of that five-year-old boy? Okay, so a lot of you are familiar with the humanitarian crisis that's happening in Syria right now. Um, not just that we are receiving a few hundred refugees, but the crisis that's really the humanitarian crisis of our lifetime and that of our children. I'm Nadia Lauer, and I'm a homeschooling mother of eight children turned humanitarian aid activist, turned founder and CEO of a local nonprofit organization called New Day Syria. And New Day Syria focuses on empowerment and aid with dignity to mothers and children inside Syria, and to some extent in Turkey, and by default here in New England as they arrive here. And today I'm going to be the voice of optimism and tell you what you actually can do to help not just the refugees, the relatively few refugees that you're going to meet in your community, but really how can we help the families inside Syria stay inside Syria. Um, but before I do that, I want to go back a little bit and tell you about why do we have this humanitarian crisis in Syria? And what's going on? There's so much politics, there's so much military, there's so many scary words out there, so many scary things happening. But what really um, is all this uh, crisis about? Let's go back to March of 2011, actually. Let's go back to spring of 2011 when we had the Arab Spring happening um, in Arab countries. Syria is a country that has had many diverse people living in it for many, many, many years. It's one of the oldest civilizations um, of our human history and one of the most um, inclusive civilizations also. So uh, in Syria for the past almost 50 years now, you've had a tyrannical dictatorial regime sitting there, as has been the case in many other Arab countries. And that is why we had the Arab Spring and you had a few rumbles and shackles here and there. Uh, in Syria, people were waiting during those months in the beginning of 2011 for something to happen in Syria. Uh, my husband was online under a different name, obviously, you know, on Facebook, trying to see what was happening in different groups. And there were actually a few attempts at rallies inside Syria. We're talking non-violent rallies in a country where people have lived in fear and they still live in fear. Uh, people don't voice their opinions public or say anything in public. But there were actually a few attempts at rallies, and some of, uh, one of them was initiated by women, uh, like holding a few signs, but they were shut down immediately. Shut down means people were arrested, people disappeared, um, and that was the end of it. And it's something that has come out you know, through social media that they actually hadn't. But in March of 2011, in a small town uh, south of Damascus called Daria, um, what happened was that some schoolboys, some 13-year-old uh, schoolboys, they went and they wrote some graffiti on their school walls. Now, what is interesting for those of us interested in those sort of things is that Saria was actually one of those towns where there was historically not any resistance to the government. It was just a working town. People were just bowing their heads down, doing what they were supposed to do, keeping quiet and going on with their lives. So it wasn't like something might happen in this place. And who would have thought that this revolution and you know the crisis that we are having was started by the graffiti of some schoolboys but that's actually what happened these schoolboys they wrote some graffiti and yeah i don't have a, a banner but the graffiti said we want change um it's your turn doctor because the bashar al-assad the president uh, he used to be a doctor he had and he has a medical degree and it was pretty much all that the graffiti said and what happened in, in return in the middle of the night, these young boys were grabbed from their beds by the Syrian secret police and taken into custody, which means that they were taken to prisons, they were tortured, and who knows what was happening to them. And that was for writing graffiti. Uh, the parents, the fathers, they were like, they would go to the governor's office over the next week 
And they would be like, please release our boys, please take us instead. These boys, they don't know what they were doing. And they were just made by ridicule. They were told, go home, make more kids, you won't see these boys again. Uh, at the same time, military moved into this town, expecting that something would happen. And people really had no plans. They just wanted the boys to be released, go on with their lives. But what happened was the whole town was put under siege. People, you know, uh, the military came with machine guns. It was severe. So people were like, hmm. So they started going out in the streets with signs, you know, release the boys. But not only that, now when they has, were seeing, being met with this uh, extreme reaction, um, they said, Can, you know, we want a little bit higher wages. They were not asking for the president to, to leave. They just wanted a little bit higher wages because in Syria everybody is paid by the government. They just wanted a little bit more of the bread. Um, and that really was the start of the Syrian revolution. People then um, started going out in rallies. And it was a non-violent uh, movement from March until July. And what happened in those pockets around Syria where people started going out with those signs, you know, once every week, usually every Friday, they would go out for uh, just a few minutes. It was just like a, a flash kind of uh, rally because people were not suicidal. And they just wanted to go out with their rallies. And in all these places, they were made by machine guns. And people were shot down eye to eye with a machine gun, with soldiers holding these machine guns, being told to shoot everybody having a sign and, and standing there. So in July of 2011, and this is important for people to understand, that the Free Syrian Army that you hear about in the news was started because people were defecting from the army, not wanting to shoot their fellow citizens. They were seeing what was happening. They were there, they were told you have to shoot or you know, a fellow soldier will kill you. And th th that's how the soldiers started defecting. Um, and it's really very similar to the Minutemen, you know, just people who, who want to go out and help. So the Free Syrian Army, it was some militia guys that escaped and also just young people who joined them. But the majority of people in Syria who dared to be part of any thought process of the revolution, they actually believed in the nonviolent movement and we still have people who strongly believe in the nonviolent movement. For me personally, what moved me to become um, involved with the whole, what is going on in Syria. I am part Syrian, my husband is Syrian, uh, but Syria is a country very far away. However, my children are three quarters Syrians. So for me, it was like, okay, what's happening in Syria? What's going on? Why are people now out rallying? I actually went to Facebook. I was looking for what's going on. I need to get it from like what I think is a neutral source, people in Syria live uh, posting and taking pictures of what was happening. And the thing, the story, the person that caught my heart, that broke me down and made me like, I have to do something, I have to figure out what's happening and really see how I can help those children. That was actually another young 13-year-old boy. Um, now, I, had a, I have a son who is 18 now, so he was 12, 13 at the time. Uh, and so there was a similarity there. The boy in Syria, his name was Hamza al-Khatib. And Hamza al-Khatib's body ended up on the doorsteps of his family's house. And all he had done was he had been smuggling milk in to this town that had been put under siege, the original town that I told you about. He had been smuggling baby milk in to those babies in, in Daria so that they could get some milk, right? And he got stopped at a checkpoint and his sin was that he, had, he was smuggling aid. And he got taken and he was tortured severely in the same prisons where they bring like, you know, the worst criminals, AKA, you know, people with a different opinion in Syria. Um, and there's actually an eyewitness last year that I heard who was uh, in a cell right next to Hamza al-Khatib during the last moments of Hamza al-Khatib's life, who said that the way Hamza al-Khatib died was that um, after he had been tortured for probably 10 days or something like that, uh, you know, the interrogator came in, he was actually going to release Hamza al-Khatib. So he brought in a picture of Bashar al-Assad and put it on the ground and he said to Hamza al-Khatib, we will release you if you bow down to this picture. Uh, most people who believe in God, and definitely for Muslims, we don't want to bow down to a person, we bow down to God only. So the 13-year-old the, the here actually did something pretty bad, you know, to the picture, um, which ended in in his death, obviously. 
Uh, and that story really touched me because it was just like this symbol of courage. Uh, we don't know, each of us, we live in a very comfortable situation, including myself, for sure. And there's no way that we know what we're going to do to stand up for other people, even in an extreme situation. And for me, something clicked at that point in time, you know, the summer of 2011, as I was mourning for Hamza al khatib and for all these other children that I was now watching uh, on Facebook. Um, and suddenly, me being a mother, many of you here are probably mothers or, or, or fathers, uh, and you know this thing when you're a mother, you're like, I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to put, you know, I consciously had decided a few years ago, prior to this, that I would not stop my car on the highway if somebody needed help because I'm a mother, I have children. I mean, I'm not going to risk my life for anybody except my children. And it sounds very selfish, but when you're a mother, it's like, my children, okay? And something changed with Syria. It was like my children and their children, they're the same. Um, and of course, maybe also I got older or wiser, but for me it became like these children, they need us. They need us to care. We need to bring hope to them because whatever the situation was that's going on in Syria, what can we do to change it? We can do something for the children. I don't believe in lobbying. I tried lobbying. I tried all the rallies. I you know, tried many different kinds of events. Um, the situation in Syria, you know, it's going to get solved, but in the meantime, we have all these children and they are really our responsibility as human beings. Um, the Syria crisis from day one was not about Syria. It was about human beings, humanity, people wanting to live in freedom, liberty and dignity. The same thing that everybody else wants. And this is the basic thing and what it boils down to all politics and all uh, the power and, and the money involved. So that's the background for Syria. And what I did and what I decided to do initially was I wanted to be as, as helpful as possible to as many people as possible without having a lot of paperwork in my way. So I called myself a freelance uh, humanitarian aid activist for one year um, in 2012 basically where I would go to different organizations, whatever project I had in mind. This is what I want to do. I want to uh, collect for winter coats, and I don't want you to, I want to make sure that all the money goes for winter coats and etc. and all different kinds of projects. I started doing humanitarian aid containers, uh, and many people were like, oh, you should start your own organization. Why should I start my own organization? I'm just like, I don't have time. I'm doing it. You know, like I'm already doing the projects. The thing is though, as you know, my focus was strictly women and children. It was also, I don't have time to talk. <laughs> I actually needed to have them. And every time you have to go to an organization, you literally have to convince them, and they're often men. And it can be like, she's saying what, and she wants what. And you know, so. <laughs> I mean, the biggest supporter was my husband, but he's also very naive. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to help you. Uh, okay. So anyways, um, after I did, I, uh, after I orchestrated five containers in three weeks, I was like, you know what, I just have to start my own organization because I'm doing all the work. We're using the network I have created inside Syria. And all I'm doing is, I mean, I'm, I was collecting the funds. And I'm just using these organizations like lack of um, self-esteem or what's going on. So that's how New Day Syria was created within five days. And of course, I had a lot of support from people because in the past two years, I had been doing stuff for Syria. So, and people that know me in the community. So having like volunteers and people who support you, people who want to be part of the organization was not really the problem. Um, so New Day Syria, what we do is we do many different things and um, I'm going to give you a short rundown of some of the projects that we do. Uh, we started originally with doing different small things, seasonal campaigns such as making sure a lot of children they have warm coats. And uh, now we're sitting here and we're freezing but we know at the end of the day we're going to go home. Inside Syria you have about 8 million people that have lost their homes. And of, 
Then you have an additional around 5 million people who left Syria altogether and they are now refugees. So we're talking about huge numbers of cold children. Uh, so you can be cold in your body, you can be cold in your heart, and you can be cold in your tummy also, obviously. From the start of what was happening in Syria, as things were evolving after you know a year into it, it was obvious that this thing wasn't going to just go away and get solved. And knowing the region and knowing extremism and all these cancerous people, you knew from the start that somebody was going to start moving into Syria. Uh, and when people are cold and hungry, obviously when children have lost their parents or they have even witnessed atrocities, um, there's going to be a reaction and one of the reactions is, I'm going to go where the food is, or, you know, I'm not being provided education, and, you know, so that's really why we feel like we are, in, you know, in a race against time. And the beautiful thing about Syria is that Syrians are so moderate and they are doing everything they can to fight these people that are in their country. So they are fighting right now ISIS, they are fighting Assad that works together with Russia and Iran, uh, and then you have local groups and stuff. So there's a lot of people fighting, but they are fighting for what is right. They just want to raise their families, live in freedom, and have a free voice. So what we do, um, some of the projects that we do, we have orphan sponsorship programs, for example, and orphan sponsorship program in New Day Syria is something where we have different orphans around Damascus, in besieged areas, also in the north, which we call Free Syria, which means this is Aleppo that you're hearing about, not just Aleppo though, there's a whole other, there's Idlib and many other areas up there. And I say free areas because you can be free on the ground and you can talk freely, but there's no free airspace, which is the result of what we're seeing. Of course, just talking about Aleppo, half of Aleppo has always been with the government. So we're talking about a small part of Aleppo that's now being annihilated. It's one of the, the old, yeah, it's, you know, like the biggest city in, in, in Syria. It's extremely sad, actually. So orphan sponsorships, it means that for $50 a month, people, they get a sheet of a child inside Syria, and then we provide education. and. and and uh, food and whatever is needed for that particular child. And the interesting thing, the reason we provided, started this program was not that we like to have a lot of extra logistics. Because running an orphan program the way I wanted it to be run with details and photos and you know exactly which donor sponsors which child is not because, I mean it's a lot of work. It's a lot of, every month you have to check up on the child. It's not a black hole, right? Um, but the, you want for us it was it's so important to continue education for the for the children. Syria has always been a very educated country, and personalizing the experience it really means that people they want to continue to support. You know, it's not just we're supporting a school, but we're supporting this child, actually. Um, other programs we do schools in general, for example. There was a moratorium, I would say, a couple of years ago, I mean a year ago, where there were like two years where people were thinking, oh, this is going to go away, and we can't focus on education, it's just survival, survival, survival. But now, about a year ago, the feedback changed completely. This is a long process, we can't wait for the children to get educated, we have to do something, they have to continue the education. I mean, you have 10 and 12 year olds now who cannot read and write in Syria, and. That's very tragic because this will affect us all for many, many years. So this is so beautiful. You have, you know, many of the women that have lost their homes, they used to be teachers. So have, the teachers are there and, you know, the children are obviously there. And sometimes it's just very small efforts. So that's been extremely satisfying to be able to start schools and see them run and have some stability and normalcy in a lot of children's lives. The children that, that we work with, I mean, we are today sitting in this wonderful, diverse community, and Syria is a country where about 86%, um, you know, as of five years ago, was Sunni Muslims. And then you have, Jew, uh, you know, different other kinds of Muslims, and other uh, Jewish people, and, and Christians, and other ethnicities. Uh, and in northern Syria, you have a small number of Christians left. Many of them, they have left the country. but. We certainly have schools where we have 5 to 10 percent that are Christians uh, in northern Syria. This is not in Damascus where you would have more people. Uh, we make a conscious effort to 
let everybody know in the community to go out actively and seek out different communities in Syria to make sure that um, we find those minorities, that they understand that whatever aid is happening is not happening just to one group of people. Obviously nobody's asking for their political background, but since we work in areas under siege or um, you know, in the north, then it's obvious uh, usually uh, which side they're on, but that's not the issue. The issue is to help human beings, to help all Syrians as they continue in this process to come together. Um, a fun, fun, fun project that New Day Syria has been doing uh, has been that we have we, we have started rebuilding homes in northern Syria. So instead of people living in tents, and this is actually a nice tent, the tents that we are seeing in photos if you go on New Day Syria's Facebook page or if you go on our website, is tents that are really just plastic sheets. Uh, the where people, they actually sleep during the night and during winters. And uh, when we started working in one particular area, very close to the Turkish border with our containers that we send in with humanitarian aid, it was so much um, uh, fun to say, hey, you know, we can start building a few homes, which we have done, and you move these women families. When I say women families, it's women who have lost their husbands. They have children and, you know, they have gone through all the stuff. They have lost their home and they have lost where they used to live in Syria. And slowly we start moving families into um, very, very, very simple homes, but it's still, you know, there's a door and there are four walls. So that has been f a fantastic project. A project that I want to mention to you all, um, and some of you probably have heard about it, is the containers of aid that we send into Syria. I mentioned in the start that it was some, you know, like in three weeks I did five containers. So let me explain to you a little bit about what these containers are. Uh, we call them vessels of love and hope. And they're basically 40 foot containers those cargo containers that you see on the highway as you drive down, that we fill um, every few weeks with donations from great people all across New England as, and all across the states. But let's stay in New England. People, they, you know, they don't, and not just they use clothes, gently used clothes or gently used shoes or gen gently used blankets even, um, but also stuffed animals, uh, soccer balls, food, medical supplies, that sort of thing. Um, and what's so beautiful is that we get a lot of feedback and photos from inside Syria and you know, you have these, when we do containers we also have photos and people often can actually see their donations being given inside Syria to children there and it's pretty incredible. Um, now I, we have done around a hundred containers, which is a lot, but the, so I guess the newness is starting to wear off <laughs> of filling these containers. But the newness of seeing, you know, these children inside every single time, you know how much of a difference you're making. It's really incredible. And the feeling you know you get when it's like, this stuff was in my kitchen. Like the first time I saw some infant um, cans, I mean, some cans of infant milk that had been in my kitchen and then I saw them in Syria, I was like almost shaking. This is like super, super exciting. <laughs> my daughter who is six, uh, she was actually, she has been part of this process since she was one year old. The first few containers I did, I literally was holding her, like there was a container I did for five hours, I was holding her and she was crying and in the end I gave her to my husband, who happily drove home and I got home like at three o'clock in the morning. And so she has been fed off of these containers. And what she does is, um, we live, we have everything at home. I mean, we have everything and you're still like, you have your credit card, you can buy everything, and you're like, where is the limit? Uh, and what I try to, you know, tell my children is, okay, if we buy stuff, we also have to share, we ha want to make sure we share at the same time. And we're not giving the stuff, like, the garbage, we're giving, we're just sharing. It's not the stuff we don't want, we're sharing. So that is a different kind of attitude to the ch children in Syria. I make sure that my children know they're not any better than them. And to put this into perspective, I have taken, and this is a full disclaimer, I have taken one or two skirts of the donations in the past five years and worn them myself. Because I want to make sure that I stay rooted and grounded and that this is not charity, it is people helping people. And once in a while, once every three months, you know, maybe my one of my 15 years will be like, oh my God, I found this book, I love this book, can, we, can I have it instead of sending it to Syria? And I'm like, considering that you just worked 15 hours, 
this week doing containers and considering that I know that you'll be sharing your own stuff. Yeah, sure, you can take that book. My point is that I want my children to know that they're the same as much as you know we do this stuff. My, my daughter, when she gets, my five-year-old Jumana, when she gets a new toy, uh, I'll be like, do you really need that? Because of course she needs a new Builder Bear. Um, <laughs> and she'll be like, Mama, I'm going to go home and I'll take a bag and I'm going to fill it or I'll donate or something. And then she'll literally be like, giving me this bag of donations and I'll be, this one was actually my first daughter's teddy bear. We're not donating that. Just, I mean, like, <laughs> so, I mean, no one is perfect. But that, that said, the first winter um, when I started doing this human turn aid for Syria, I went through my attic and I took out basically 90% of the baby stuff I was keeping for no particular reason. All those things where you're like, I have eight children, so I did have a collection. Um, but there were, you know, you, you know, all those memories that you have that when we die, what are they going to, to, to matter? Um, a few things might matter, but not a lot. We don't need all this stuff. Uh, and I was like, if I can do it, definitely anybody can do it. You know, send it off to people who need this hope. Mothers who, their children are freezing to death. There has to be something we can do. So that's one way that you can work. You, I mean, you, that you can help. You can um, donate stuff. You can also buy food and buy new underwear that you send off. And you can also come out or set up a collection. And of course, the good thing is you can also always donate money. Uh, always make your research, you know, where does the money go and etc. But there is stuff we can do. We don't have to sit at home, watch the TV This is and say this is so sad. No. It is so sad. It is incredibly sad. I barely watch the news. If I watch the news, I would be like depressed. It's very, very depressing. But there's always something we can do. So the motto of New Day Syria which I'm going to end with, is one person at a time, one humanity closer. Because each of us, we can choose to be a catalyst for change. Thank you. All right, so my name is Nora, and I'm freezing. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. So my name is Nora, and I'm Syrian. This seemed like a really simple enough introduction, but it seems as this simple word Syrian, especially in this election year, has meaning far beyond its definition. When people first meet me, they act genuinely, genuinely surprised when I tell them that I'm Syrian. So they look at me confused and say, but you don't look Syrian. <laughs> and they ask them, have you ever met a Syrian before? <laughs> and they say, no, you're the first one. <laughs> and I ask them, if I'm the first Syrian you've ever met, then how do, do you know what Syrians look like? <laughs> the response is, you just don't look like you, how you're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> now we can all agree that this is amusing, but there's something disturbing about it too. There are so many assumptions and associations bundled along with the single descript descriptive word that the person behind the word becomes invisible. I would like everyone to take a moment to ask themselves honestly what comes to their mind when they hear the phrase, I'm Syrian. I want you to think about your assumptions and associations. What do you really hear when someone introduces themselves in this way? Most of you probably thought of images of war, of refugees fleeing in boats, of children shocked beyond emotion, and perhaps a, co and perhaps a couple of you even thought of tabbouleh or kibbe. <laughs> but when I hear the phrase I'm Syrian, I think of bait. In Arabic, this means home. This is not just a physical building when you're, when, where you happen to sleep, have bills sent to, to, se have bills sent to or a place let, let your laundry pile up. It's much more than that. It's a sense of belonging, a feeling of family, a place of memories, and a sense of safety, safety and of simple normalcy. For all the pictures you've seen of bombed out buildings and roads filled with rubble all over Syria, there are millions of pictures like this, like this community here. Bait home, forever lost. I want you to understand that not only has the sense of home been destroyed for so many people, 
Yeah, more importantly, understand that this concept existed in the first place. That the sense of home is so strong and such an essential part of, a, of our Syrian identity. Now I'm going to, to talk about a little bit about my journey. So I was born and raised in home Syria and spent two years in college studying chemical engineering. I was, and in many respects still am, just a simple college student wanting what most people my age want, a good education, an opportunity for a meaningful career, the chance to have lasting friendships, just to experience life in a normal way. After the revolution disintegrated into a civil war, I decided to come to the United States as an international student with the full intention of returning to Syria as soon as the conflict, conflict ended. Each successive year has made that dream more and more remote. I arrived in the United States in the winter of 2013 and quickly found myself transported from a war zone into a safe environment of an elite all-woman liberal art college. To, so that, to say that this was a very disorienting experience, it's an understatement. <laughs> I found myself between cultures constantly negotiating and interacting in multiple worlds, with competing social expectations and values, with what seems trivial, trivial to one is important to another. For example, how to dress, how to interact with members of the opposite sex, individualism versus collectivism. Perhaps most, important, most importantly for our discussion today, I arrived just three months or before the Boston Marathon bombing and the sub subsequent rise of Islamophobia in the United States. I heard and felt a level of bigotry that was unimaginable, unimaginable in the Syria of my youth. It was my first lessons in how negative stereotypes and prejudice. So to be clear, Prejudice is preconceived negative judgment of a group and its individual members. It's a distinct combination of feelings, inclination to act, and beliefs. So it's beliefs that are often supported by negative stereotypes about a group of people. This is something, something we all know about, but rarely question or think about the consequences. Take, take for example, the hijab, the headscarf that many millions of Muslim women throughout the world choose to wear. There is a common stereotype that women who wear hijab are conservative or are forced to wear it. The hijab is a simple piece of clothing, carries with its mind, with, with, it, with it in the mind of others so much importance and meaning. Most people would think that my mom, or maybe Nadia, both of whom chose to wear hijab are somehow more conservative and close-minded than someone like myself who does not. I can assure you that this is not true. These assumptions become beliefs and the stereotype is perpetuated. So like my mom raised me and me and my mom are the same. She wear a hijab, I don't. Mm -hmm. But we, we have the same beliefs and maybe progressive, open-minded way of thinking. The real danger is when these stereotypes combine with an atmosphere and poisonous rhetoric by reckless politicians to feed prejudice. A few months ago, I had a long conversation with a Syrian friend of mine who is attending community college in Connecticut, which, as you know, one of the most liberal states in the U.S. A professor from one of her classes had singled her in front of all of the students in the class as a follower of Islam because she wears a hijab. He proceeded to pronounce to the class that he has books that prove Islam is an aggressive religion and Muhammad was a murder murderer. He also implied that the Prophet Muhammad was a child monster and that basically you were stupid if you followed Islam after comparing it to Christianity. I want to assure you that I'm not taking his words out of context because my friend had been recording in the class. I heard his words with my own ears. I don't need to explain to you just how deeply offensive his comments are. There are lar larger points to be made here. Now you might be saying to yourself, this could never happen in my community. 
but it's happening in liberal Connecticut, and it's happening everywhere around the country. Don't think for a moment that it can cannot happen here because it's, it already is. A supposedly well-educated ed person with the responsibility for educating the younger, younger generation present bigotry and ignorance as if they were fact. Students did not challenge him because, he, because of his position of authority and legitimacy. On the recording, you can hear other students agreeing with the professor's so-called analysis. The professor acted with impun impunity without fear of reprimand or getting fi fired because he truly believed his words to be true. And the students silently accepted his word either out of agreement or conformity. Conformity is not just acting as other people act. It's also being affected by how they act. From conformity, it's just a small step toward acceptance. Even a slight change of attitude toward a person or a group leads to change in behavior. This is why people like the professor might, must be confronted. When discussing this, this with other Muslims, I encountered a sense of resignation. It happens all the time. Nothing you could do about it. Don't speak up because it might come back to hurt you. Don't make waves. Where are the comments I heard? For, for my friend, there was also the, also the pressure to confirm. For fear of retaliation, if she spoke up, she had to think about her grade, her, accept, her acceptance by her classmates, her future. Experiences like this make a young immigrant really question the values of the communities and the countries they have sought refuge in. And I have another story that happened right yesterday. So I was heading to Staples to print posters for New Day Syria. I went there right at 8.30. I took an Uber and went to Staples in Somerville. And um, I waited online and tried to print. It didn't work. Then I had to lock my phone and stuff on a computer. And so the man who was working on the print printing services was very helpful at first and took so much time to help the female before ahead of me and was very friendly to me until he saw the con content of the poster. Mm -hmm. huh. And then he told me, well, can you come tomorrow? I don't think we have time to, do, to, to give you the posters tonight. That we're closing and it's almost nine. He said, I've been waiting here for 20 minutes. I already opened the computer and it's printing. So he said, well, we can't print that amount. And I said, how, how many can you print? And then he said, I don't know. And he went there to ask, like in a really just rude, disturbing way. And I was sad, but he went there and came back and he said, well, may maybe we can print five or ten. Mm. But I was already pressed print to the printer and the posters were already printing. And then I said, is this printer working already? <laughs> and he said, did you press print? Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, <laughs> "This like he he literally screamed in, in staples and said this will take this will take all the ink." Was like <laughs> so. <laughs> so other employees heard him and and I was like just I was frustrated. I didn't say anything. I was almost crying because he was first silent and then his reaction was like almost screaming and I just I just saw how how nice he was before and then when I when he cl came closer to the computer and I was asking him should I press portrait or this landscape and then he saw what's inside the poster he just flipped mm. 30 60 degrees and um, I ended up printing the posters but I left staples and I cried for like 10 minutes mm -hmm. because it's sad, and because I woke up the night before, the day, the morning before, on a video for what's happening in Aleppo, and it, it's sad that uh, people are separating humans, like we're all the same, we all have the same maybe, we're, we, we could all experience the same experiences in different situations. 
So it's, it's hard to not to be discouraged by the enormity of the situation and just, and just how much needs to be done. But every mile begins with a single step. So what steps can be done? Engage with your community, talk to your family and friends about your experience today, share what you've heard and have learned. But more importantly, engage outside of your community too. We need, we need to, to remove the negativity surrounding word Syrian by presenting it in a positive light. Talk to people you don't know and gently have them confront their own biases. Make being kind and helping refugees a normal thing. Something to celebrate, not to hide. Invite refugees to your home and bring them in, into your community. Your life and the, there will be richer for it. I'm gonna tell you another story mm -hmm. about Bill and Julie. So this summer, while doing an internship in New Haven, I was invited to stay with an older American couple for the last two weeks of my internship. They invited me into their home and into their lives. We had long conversations about so many different things. And even though they're very progressive people, I think they were surprised by how similar we were in our hopes and dreams and aspirations. And they were so much like my grandparents. Exactly the same. Just an English version. <laughs> <laughs> so remember this always. Our, sim our similarities vastly outnumber our differences. Go out of your way to invite refugees over coffee. This is a simple act that Syrian refugees would find normal and comfortable because it's what we do when we meet someone new at home. A simple welcoming gesture will bring the feeling of home back into their lives. So simple acts can have a huge impact because most refugees want something so simple that it's just a tiny slice of normal life to build upon. One Saturday this summer, I spent eight hours swimming and playing at the beach and I felt young again for the first time since forever. But at the same moment I was laughing and playing, I felt guilty, thinking about all the other Syrians my age who are not only unable to experience water, but who have not experienced silence or peace for long that they could have recognized. The war in Syria has forged an early maturity upon us. It has consumed our minds and occupied them with big ideas. Not because we needed to find life, but because we needed to become strong enough to help ourselves, support everyone else, and most importantly, to save Syria. Our youth is now a mixture of fun and guilt. Every single Syria I meet in, Syrian I meet in America who is finding personal success is also experiencing the same sense of guilt that I feel is every beautiful thing I participate in. The precious, the precious years of use can never be recaptured. Let us all remember that refugees and most adolescents in war-torn countries are all the same in their longing for laughter, for freedom, and friendships. <coughs> that's all they want, and that's all they're aiming for. Thank you so much for listening and for being here. Well, one of the things you made a very interesting point, how do we bridge that? How do, I want to introduce Syrian refugees to my friends. You're the first two I've met. I want to be able to put a human face on them. Most of my friends are pretty conservative. So to show that you guys are human, and you're human beings, and what's happening, and you're not statistics, and you're not a Donald Trump punching bag. So how do I meet people like you two? I mean, how, do, how does that happen? You said about having coffee. You know, how does that happen? <laughs> but how does that happen where I can meet people to introduce them to my friends and my, my community? Yes, it's a... Run thing, perhaps, to that, just to... Mm -hmm. how in a college, we have so many colleges to represent. How many yeah. colleges do that as well? You know. okay. But also, not just the colleges. No, we need regular people. Right. <laughs> 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 we need people
Yeah, so uh, we love the question and we're each going to take a step at answering it. Where are all those refugees? Uh, <laughs> Uh, they are going to be here, there are some families, I know Worcester has some families and how you're going to connect with them. Um, that is a good question. Um, so there are different churches, resettlement agencies, mosques, um, where these refugees would be working with. Um, where are you located? I'm in uh, Hubbardston, Massachusetts, which is by Gardner. Yeah, so yeah. So um, there is no hotline 101. How do I reach a refugee? <laughs> okay. So what I would suggest is to get to know the, Syri the Syrians who already integrated in the American society, and maybe attend more Syrian events like uh, maybe conferences, maybe re uh, refugee fundraiser, and get to know more Syrians, and then move to the next step, which is meeting refugees. Because refugees need time when they come to the country, and uh, sometimes they're overwhelmed, because they're mostly coming from extremely poor areas, and they've been in really extreme situations. They're not the privileged ones. So after knowing more Syrians, you would understand the culture more and you'll use your creativity to how to interact with refugees. Most importantly is just to give them time. And thank you for trying to get to know refugees. So, <clears throat> talking about that, as I mentioned the containers that we do for example, and I have a flyer that you can grab the flyer that Noah uh, yesterday was yeah, printing yeah. out, so everybody make sure you grab flyers. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's not. Yeah, they are at the table up here on the porch. So these are just basic flyers with some information on a, a container day, where we get Syrians out, and there will always be probably you know a few refugees. Um, of course, that's very far from you, but it's really true what Noah said. The refugees we are, we are going to be seeing, and that we are already seeing in our community, they are. <clears throat> refugees who often don't speak English and they definitely want friends but it you know you want it to be slow but they are very open people but they are also the ones who were underprivileged and they did not have the money to live in a different way and so there are um, many things that they're going to have as a culture shock but we, we're so happy that there are people like you even people with Trump friends like you <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> Yes, so the question is about the aid process, how do we get aid into Syria versus what's happening with the UNHCR. Um, to explain, you know, UNHCR is an international organization that uh, the, what you're seeing in the news is them trying to get aid in around Damascus after they ask permission of the, uh, President uh, uh, Assad, you know, can we bring the aid in? They may or may not say yes, and what we have seen is that a lot of the aid already had, gets taken from the convoys and then, you know, taken, given to the military themselves. So, New Day Syria, like many other organizations, um, we work very freely, very, you know, creatively. We do not have to ask anybody for any um, permission, No, would I. <laughs> uh, that being said, of course, we are 501c3, we work together with our American government, we, I'm a mother, we run an organization, we follow all the rules, so we follow the rules of our government here in our country, and we work together with Turkey, uh, but what our aid, the containers that we send, for example, let's talk about containers, since they're big, big, big containers, and they contain maybe 1500 boxes and bags and different items, right? You can't smuggle that under the wire anywhere. Um, they actually go through Turkey, and Turkey a long, long time ago, I mean five years ago, said that it would accept humanitarian aid containers going into northern Syria through its border without any issues as long as the containers were not opened in Turkey. I mean, having refugees in Turkey is obviously also a business, right? Um, so the organizations in Turkey, they will buy from, you know, Turkish merchants and, and distribute aid there. But the containers that we send, they get transloaded through a shipper. There's a lot of paperwork involved, obviously. They get transloaded in Turkey, and then they get uh, driven on a truck by a Turkish driver. That's also, you know, everything is on the paper. Gets to northern uh, um, Syria, where it, it goes through a process there, and then uh, the, the truck arrives inside Syria, and our team then comes. And so there's a lot of paperwork, but it's all, you know, that's how it goes out. So trucks driving around in northern Syria, they could get bombed.
but that's different from what you're describing whether or not we have to ask permission. Other aid projects such as building homes, orphan programs, um, raising weed, you know, uh, like, you know, plants and, and vegetables and all those sort of things, that's money that goes into Syria and then we do the projects there. Uh, and that's a, a different process, but it's also totally possible. When you hear the besieged areas in Syria, oftentimes it's like, it is actually possible for organizations like New Day Syria and other organizations like us to get aid in because it's money that goes in and in those besieged areas, in many cases, not in all cases, there is storage areas where some people taking advantage of the situation actually have food if you can buy it. Um, so there's always two sides. Not everybody is, is a good person. Not everybody, you know, if, if they have a starving neighbor, is going to feed them unless you pay them. That's just the reality of life. Uh, I would argue that Islamophobia is not a condition that has been in the United States for many, many years. And as a new person in the United States, it didn't exist 10, 20, 30 years ago. So I think in, in the grand discussion, not necessarily here, we have to discuss how we got to Islamophobia here, which is true, and how do we move away from it. So I would like maybe later on in the discussions, people who have come here, to realize it's not a permanent condition here. To me, it's a new condition. I would say to Michelle that not all people hate Palestinians. I've heard that word. I've never hated Palestinians ever. Uh, it's specific to some parts of society. And how, let us say, do we all together move in another direction? Thank you. So I guess I want to comment on that, actually. I, I think I want to comment on that. Um, Islamophobia is actually not something new. I mean, I've been in the country for 20 years, and, uh, you know, I've been dealing with Islamophobia. I'm, I'm only part Syrian, I'm Danish, and I literally cannot go to the doctor without... They can't even talk to me before they understand where my accent is from. There's just this whole preconceived notion. You're putting this thing on your head. I cannot get past that. Like, I can't place you. I can't focus on what you're saying because you are representing something else. And of course, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, it might be that there are many people that are now sensing that it's not this Islamophobia, but it, it has been around for a long time. What we're seeing right now, what my children are experiencing right now, my six-year-old who doesn't put on a hijab, but she has a mother who looks like this, um, is worse than after 9-11. It is worse than after 9-11. I mean, uh, I am for the first time thinking if I should get a gun, you know, I am thinking if I should get a, a real guard dog, uh, am I safe, you know, what is the situation, I'm meeting a lot of hostility. What Noah experienced the other day, yesterday, was actually very exciting to hear, because here's this girl who doesn't look like a Muslim, her name could be anything, she looks pretty cool and cute, uh, but as soon as there was a kind of identification with Syria, which now is being associated with Islam, the whole situation changed, um, and what has happened right now for me when I go shopping, and that did not happen after 9-11, is that uh, people in authority, in, in stores, etc., they feel, you know, if they have an inclination to feel that way, they feel that they, um, it's okay for them to dismiss me and to be super rude to me. Even in doctor offices, I'm getting treated very badly. Of course, they're talking to the wrong person here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they try. They really, really try, and I haven't experienced that before. After 9-11, I mean, people will go out of their way to hold the door and to show, you know, that it's not, oh, we're, we're not trying to generalize. So, yeah, I mean, there's work to be done. We are trying as the Muslim community to be more out there, um, but we, we also need our neighbors to you know, make us feel welcome because right now we are feeling personally threatened and, and a little bit afraid. I wonder if you could say something about the rise of ISIS and how that came about. <laughs> its connection with the free Syria. I mean, I know there's no connection, but just to understand that a little bit. Yes, I'm not a political analyst, but it's a very important subject. Um, 
As I said, all Syrians knew from the beginning that extremism would move into Syria because, you know, borders were open and you have this wound happening in Syria. Uh, the, the people who, who started ISIS, uh, they were extremists coming from the outside. And the interesting thing is that they are attracting non-Syrians, people who are borderline Muslims, and it's coming out now in studies actually from dis uh, people who deserted or people uh, who, who were killed, you know, and they know the history, they are your parents, uh, young people from Europe. But these are people who, many of them were converts even, and they, many of them were people who are like second generation immigrants who have always been marginalized, not feeling part of their <coughs> societies, who don't even know really their religion. I am, you know, I am very close Facebook friends with a Danish mother, I mean, I'm friends with the mother of uh, James Foley, that, who was obviously killed by ISIS, and I, I'm also friends with a Danish mother whose son converted to Islam, he has some learning disabilities, so he's finding this religion, he's finding, you know, not just a religion that he believes in, but then the community that he found, being, you know, learning disabled, not reading the sources, Quran, or books on Islam on his own, really. Um, it was the community he found in Denmark, this is just an example, actually, they were out to recruit. <laughs> they were recruiters, okay? have no idea why, you know, there can be an address and people, you know, in Denmark, they're not taking care of it, but we have the same happening in different areas uh, in Europe. Um, so he went to Syria um, and, you know, he's there and he's starting to change his mind, actually, he's starting to see, oops, what is really, of course, he's like in a microcosm, not seeing everything that's happening, but he's part of, he was part of ISIS. Uh, and he ended up getting killed. And his mother is like out there talking against ISIS, against ostracizing our youth. She's talking, you know, for Islam. She's not a Muslim, but she has no issue with Islam. She has, she has issues with us, uh, with communities not, you know, educating the youth or being part of, you know, what's, what's happening out there. Um, so, so really for us as Muslims, Syrians, moderate Syrians, and I would say all Syrians except a minuscule minority, they really are moderate people. They are opposed to ISIS. We're going to have to um, break this off now.